everyone. I would like to welcome you to Hearts Connected, and we're broadcasting or recording uh, in Venice, Florida, but this is uh, uh, this is going to different parts of the world. But I would like to thank you for welcoming us into your homes and allowing us to share with you from our heart, to share with you from our heart about uh, the words, of, the Word of God. Now, if you would take a moment to notice. We have something new in our set. It's something's different from our set, from our previous recordings. And, and that's going to happen every so often because we want to, you know, make some changes, make some adjustment, make it better. But more than that, uh, I would like to thank you for tuning in today. So shall we start with a prayer? Father, we thank you for this time. We ask God that you just prepare our hearts to hear your word and to be encouraged and built up in you in jesus name we pray amen once again my name is joy mckinnis and the show that you're tuning in is hearts connected now i do have a question for you right at the very start of this program do you consider yourself to be a giant slayer yes you heard me giant slayer have you ever considered yourself to be a giant slayer Maybe you're thinking, oh, no, 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 Pastor Joy, I'm short, I'm 5'2", I cannot fight a giant, or I'm skinny, or I'm weak, or I'm uneducated. You know, we can say all these excuses, and at the end of this program, I hope that I would encourage you that in Christ, we all have the potential, and we all have the ability to become a giant slayer. So let's go right into our um, lesson for today. Now, one of the most familiar uh, stories in the Bible is the story about David and Goliath. So if you grew up in a church, then you know very well the story about David, the shepherd boy, and Goliath, the giant. Now, in our everyday life, we face giants. Giants in situations, sometimes people that seems to be this uh, challenging individual in our lives that we cannot overcome or we don't know what to do with or re how to respond to. So hopefully uh, we would learn from the strategy that God has given us in order to overcome or, or in order to deal with these giants in our life. Now let's learn about Goliath. Who is this Goliath? Goliath was from Gath and he was fighting with a Philistine. Now, Goliath's size and appearance was very impressive for one because he was very big. He was huge. He was about nine feet and a half tall. I'm only 5'4", but he's nine feet and a half. So that's really a very, very big guy. Now, not only was his size uh, uh, impressive, but he was also wearing this incredible armor, suit of armor. He had this uh, bronze helmet, you know, over his head, and he wore a coat of scale armor of, made of bronze that weighs very heavy. And then on his legs, there were bronze uh, greaves, or greaves is actually armor for the shin. And then also he has this bronze javelin or a spear that was slung over his shoulder. Now, this giant, just, just gauging from his size and his impressive, massive, uh, you know, look, he seems to be absolutely beyond defeat. It's like, oh no, I can never defeat this individual. Now, the Bible says that Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, and this is what he was saying. Why do you come out? and line up for battle. Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose then a man, and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. So you know, this story about the lion, you could read in 1 Samuel, chapter 17. Now, what Goliath was proposing actually was what is now known, what is known in the Eastern world as representative battle. Meaning, representative, representative battle means that it is a one-on-one -on -one fight. That he would represent the Philistine army 
And whoever would represent the, es the Israeli army, army, they would fight. And if Goliath won, then the Philistine wins. And if the one that represents the Israeli Israelites win, then the whole army would, would win. So Goliath, you know, he challenged the Israelites. Not only did he challenge the, uh, the Israelites for one day, that if there's anybody who could fight him, who would be brave enough to defeat him. So no, not only did he, he send out the challenge just for one day, but he did it for 40 days. Twice a day he would go out in the forefront of the battle and he would shout this, this challenge to the, the Israelites. And he, would, he, he did it for 40 days. 40 days morning and evening. But you know, sadly, for 40 days, no one from Israel was willing to fight the giant. Nobody came forward and said, I'm going to fight this giant. So for 40 days, challenge went on and no response. Now, how about David? Now, about 10 or 15 miles from where Goliath was, up in the Judean mountain in a, vill in a village of Bethlehem, there was this teenager named David. And he was tending the sheep of his father. Now, he was too young to fight. That's why he was not sent to battle. But, uh, but what happened is he had brothers who was fighting against, against, the, uh, uh, against the enemy, you know, with the Israelite army. He had brothers who, who went out to war. So this particular day, David was called by his father to bring food, you know, uh, refreshments to his three brothers who was in the army and so he went to the camp where the where the, the Israel the Israelites were and then while he was there all he could hear is this shout coming from the giant so when David saw Goliath and heard his runtings David was not impressed could you imagine that a small shepherd boy was not impressed and was not intimidated and what David did is he asked the men who were standing near him and asked them, what will be done for the men who will kill this Philistine and remove this disgrace from Israel? And so they repeated to him what they were told, that uh, this is what would, what would King Saul give to the men who would uh, defeat Goliath, that he would be given great riches, and he would be given the king's daughter in marriage, and he would be also given a family tax exemption. So those are pretty good incentives to kill a giant, right? But because Goliath was so big, nobody was willing to risk their life, even with all these um, incentives, incentives that the king was planning to give them. Now, the next thing that happened to David is what we would call an older brother syndrome. The Bible says that Eliab is, Eliab is David's oldest brother. When he heard him speaking with the men, uh, he, he told David, so why did you come here? Whom did you leave the ship uh, in the desert? I know that you are conceited and how wicked you are in, his, in your heart, and you came down here only to watch the battle. So Eliab, like I said, was the, uh, the oldest son of Jesse. So uh, if you would recall, or maybe uh, there was a, uh, the prophet Samuel was commissioned by God to go into the house of Jesse because uh, God told the prophet that there the next king, you, you would find the next king. So when the prophet came to the household of Jesse, and Eliab, the oldest son, came, uh, came out. Immediately, the prophet said, surely this is the next king because he looks very impressive. But then God told the prophet, no, no, that is not the one. And so Jesse paraded seven of his sons, you know, uh, to, the, to the prophet. But the Lord has always has, has, has told uh, the prophet, that none of this is the chosen one. So finally the prophet said, are these all your sons? And then um, the, the father said, oh, I do have a youngest son, but he's in, the, he's in the field. And so the prophet said, go, 
go, go, go, get your son. And as soon as Samuel saw David, as soon as he saw David, he knew, because the voice of God spoke to him, that this is to be the next king, and that he would anoint David with oil, with olive oil, and separate him to be the next king for Israel. And this he did in front of all his older brother brothers. And so the older brother Eliab, the, the eldest, watched as his youngest brother was being, uh, being um, uh, what do you call this, anointed in front of his brothers to be king, to be king. So, you know, uh, Haddon Robin, Robinson had a saying, and I would like to quote this. He said that in any situation, what you are determines what you see. And what you see determines what you do. So what you are determines what you see, and what you see determines what you do. Everything is about perception, and it comes and it boils out of who you are. Like you would have a, a glass of water that is filled halfway, you know, a glass that is filled halfway with water, and one person would say, oh, it is half empty, while another would say, oh, it is still half full. So it's just a matter of perception because of uh, who the person is. Now, I would like for us to learn some principles from this story if we want to become a giant slayer. Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay. Number one principle. Giants do not make or break us. They simply show us who we are already. Let me repeat it. Giants do not make or break us. They simply show who we are already. So David did not become a hero the day that he killed Goliath. The hero was just being exposed. The hero that he is, that is already him, was just being exposed by the circumstance. So giants simply would show us who we already are. Did you get that? It would just reveal who we already are. So the same way that any circumstances that we might be facing, you know, it will reveal who, what we are made of. It will reveal our faith. It will reveal our maturity. It will reveal our character. It will reveal our standard. You know, Char Charles Spurgeon once said, trials teach us what we are. They dig up the soil and let us see what we are made of. Trials teach us what we are. They dig up the soil and let us see what we are made of. You know, when we are overcome by difficult circumstances, you know, uh, who we really are, who we are already, will come out of the surface. If you are a person that has been, has been making great deposit of God's word and of God in your life, then you would look at the circumstance and say, I can, I can overcome this, not by my own strength, but through God. So you are very positive because you know that in your, own, in your own strength, you cannot do anything, and so you are not overcome by your circumstance. So it will reveal who you really are. It will just reveal who you are. Now, another principle that we could learn from this is we need to face the problem. We need to face the problem. How many times have any of you tried to avoid facing the problems? Did the problem disappear? Let me ask you, did the problem disappear? When you have a big, let's just say, water bill that you need to pay, and you know you don't have the money and you don't want to face the problem. When you try to ignore the problem, did the water bill disappear? I don't think so. It's still there. You still have to address it, right? So we need to face the problem. We sometimes get distracted with what the real issue is in our lives. You know, we try to avoid the problem. We try to cover up it. We try to blame it to other people or to some insignificant, unrelated issues, you know? 
And, and sometimes uh, it's just easy to blame it to other people. I'm sure we've been guilty of this, right? I'm sure we've been guilty of this. For example, a husband who has been given an impossible, maybe, uh, task at work, you know, and then there's this pressing deadline that he needs to finish the work, he would come home frustrated and he would yell at his wife and that he wants his dinner ready in five minutes. And then when the wife cannot give the dinner in five minutes, he blames the wife and say, I can't believe that the dinner is late. I told you I want it in five minutes and it's already late. So he starts to vent his frustration coming from the real issue that is really frustrating him to his wife. And how often we have done this to people that we love, to people around us, to our friends, to our church mate, to people in the workplace, to, to our spouse. And then, you know, we regret that afterwards, okay? So we need to fa face the real issue the same way that David faced the giant. So when David heard the threats of Goliath, so this is in 1 Samuel 17, 26, who does this Philistine think he is anyway that he would defy the armies of God? So he just wouldn't allow this 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 Philistine uh, to insult his God and to insult God's people. And he was not going to live in fear. And so this, this righteous indignation rose up from within him and he wants to defeat the, the giant. So the enemy, the enemy that we face every single day, and these are the giants that we face day by day in our life, you know, they want us to live in fear. They, love, they want us to cower in fear. They want us to retreat. They want us to uh, not uh, uh, recognize who we really are in Christ, you know, and just give up. So, you know, Scripture has given us a lot of encouragement. Like, for example, Luke one thirty seven says, For nothing is impossible with God. If we put our trust and our confidence in God in overcoming difficult situations in our life in overcoming these giants that are uh, uh, that are you know just uh, just overwhelming us Luke 137 said that nothing is impossible with God Romans 815 says for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear but you re receive the spirit of adoption so Really, these, these, these giants that we face, you all they want to do is to, to cripple us with fear, okay? But we need to face them, not in our own strength, and not in our own wisdom, not in our own understanding, but through Christ, amen? That's the way to overcome it, my friend. We are not called to live in fear. But we need to trust in the Lord and the, and, 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 and the power of the Holy Spirit that is operating in our lives. Okay? Now, number three principle. Okay? Number one is giants do not make or break us. They simply show who we really are already. Principle number two says we need to face the problem. Now, let's go to principle number three. Practice faith in the let, lesser battles of life. We need to practice faith in the lesser battles of life. Now, the victories are first won in the training room, not on the field. You know, uh, they said that uh, practice. We need to practice our faith, just like a muscle that we need to practice. Uh, we need to exercise our muscle. You know, so that the muscle becomes stronger, the muscle becomes more, uh, more, more. It will, uh, it will become become stronger. So in the same way that we need to exercise our faith, you know, in the lesser battles of life, so that when the big battles of life come our way, our faith muscles have grown already. We've been exercising it, so it's, it has been growing. It has been operating in greater measure in our life. So where do you think that David's unwavering confidence in God came from? Where did you think his, he did not just went into the battlefield, saw the giant, and, you know, without any preparation behind the scene, just said, I'm going to slay the giant. 
Now, I would like to read to you 1 Samuel 17, 37. It says there that the Lord who saved me, this is uh, David now speaking, the Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So this tells us that though David was out there in the field tending the sheep of his father, he was allowing his faith to grow in the day-to-day -day circumstances. He, he said that he, he believed that the Lord saved him from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear. So therefore, so, so he, he, he's been exercising his faith that God is with him, that he, would, that he is able to overcome every circumstance. In the smaller or the bigger or the medium-sized testing that he would encounter, that God was with him, helping him overcome. And so when this big giant of Goliath, he was right there face to face with him, his faith was was already operational to the degree that he to the degree that he could say, I could slay this giant. I could slay this giant. So the encouragement for us today is that we need to practice our faith in the lesser, lesser battles of life. We need to exercise our faith in the lesser battles of life. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, principle number four. Do not stand in the way of a giant slayer. Maybe at this point in your life, you do not feel that you're a giant slayer yet. So I put the word yet, okay, because we're going to grow. But, but if you're not a giant slayer yet, you think, then don't stand in the way of a giant slayer. Make sure you don't stand in the way of those who wish to be. Remember David's brother, the oldest brother, Ilya? You know, Ilya, you know, sometimes uh, when we are, uh, we are believing to do great exploits for God, or when we feel that God has called us to, uh, to, to, uh, to a higher degree of faith walk, maybe to step out of our comfort zone and do something, you know, uh, totally out of the ordinary, out of the normal in our life. And when we do that, when we do step out in faith, sometimes uh, we have family members that would try to hinder us. We might have people that are close to us who would try to hinder us from pursuing the things of God. So, in my, as my job as a pastor and our job also as a, as a, a brothers and sisters in the Lord is that we would spur each other on to, to become who we are called to be in Christ, okay? And so my job as a minister and as a pastor is to equip the people that God has entrusted to us to do the work of the ministry, okay? And we don't want them to remain in the baby face of their walk in God. We want them to become mature, to be growing and mature and to be overcoming and to be doing exploit for God. First Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Amen? And principle number five, never adopt the enemy's method. Never adopt the enemy's method. In other words, in short, be yourself. Be yourself. Be yourself. You know, King Saul tried to dress David in his own armor. He tried to dress David in the king's armor to prepare him for battle. But then David was not used to that. He was just used with his little slingshot, you know, because that's what he used in the, in the field when he's tending the sheep. So never use somebody else's armor. Be yourself. Be comfortable to operate in the anointing, in the gifting, in the talents, and everything that God has given you as an individual, okay? Never assume that what worked for somebody else to, to defeat their giant will automatically work for you, okay? Never assume that. So if, if, uh, if David has gone out to face Goliath in this armor, he could hardly walk 
with the armor because he's this tiny little boy. So he, he needs to be who he is in order to defeat the enemy. So that's another thing. If you want to be a giant slayer, be yourself. Don't try to copy anybody else. Be yourself, okay? And principle number six, don't forget the, to remember the size of your God. You might be a small little Filipina, or you might be uh, uh, an uneducated person, or you might be, you might think of all these limitations that you put upon yourself. That's okay, but I want you to remember that one of the principles to be an effective giant slayer is to remember the size of your God. Remember the size of your God. Remember the size of your God. First John 4.4 4 said that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Who is in us? Wow! Wow! The Holy Spirit is in us. So greater is he that is in us than he that is in the word, world. And Philippians 4 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So if we are uh, limiting ourselves because we're just seeing in the natural what we're made of and what we have, then we need to remember who our God is. Amen? We should remember who our God is. So my question to you as we close the show is, what are the giants in your life right now? Maybe the giant is shouting right now, oh, you are unqualified to do the job. Or, or, or maybe the giant is saying, you're not good enough. Or maybe the giant is saying, you will never succeed or you can never be trusted. Or maybe the giant is saying, oh, you're going to lose your kids. You're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your business. Well, we need to stand upon the word of God. We need to stand on the word of God that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the word, okay? So what are the giants that you are facing now? You know, you, we need to rise up in the authority that God has given us and the authority that God has already put in us through the power of the Holy Spirit and through our relationship with Jesus Christ. So if you are overcome by giants today, my friend, remember, Remember who is the God that you serve. Remember who is in you. And you will overcome. You will overcome. So let us pray. Father, we just thank you for encouraging us with your word today. That we are giant slayers. That you have given us every weapon to overcome every circumstance, every giants that we might be facing today. And Father, we put our trust in you, not in men, not in ourselves. We put our trust in you, God. And we thank you for encouraging us with your word today. Thank you for tuning in, my friends, and hope to see you soon again, okay? God bless you. Take care and be a giant slayer. Everything that's meant to be when you shine on me, shine on me. You show the hope, show the dream Everything that's meant to be when you shine